Hello, and welcome to Am I Thinking Right, where I, Jordan Wright, a current freshman at UNH, delve into and try to understand complex topics. In this episode, I will be looking at the historical and cultural significance of transient mental illnesses and their possible connections to the climate disaster being experienced in present day. As always, this podcast is meant to spark discussions, not present definite truths. Thank you for being here. Before this episode begins, I want to start with a quick disclaimer. A proper term for the psychological effects due to anthropogenic climate change does not exist. In this podcast, eco-anxiety, climate distress, psychotyratic illness, and solastasia will all be used. The importance of nomenclature and taxonomic, taxonomic classification will be discussed later in this podcast. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy this episode. To begin this episode, we're going to be discussing what a transient mental illness is. The large of this research comes from a book entitled Mad Travelers, Reflections on the Reality of Transient Mental Illnesses, written by Ian Hacking. For this source and all other sources used throughout this podcast, I will have a link to them in the show notes below. Let's start with a quick definition of transient mental illnesses. By Hacking's definition, transient mental illnesses are illnesses that appear at a time, in a place, and later fade away. The ability for a transient mental illness to do this is a presence of a niche. This niche is very similar to the ecological niche used in biology, meaning that it is the organism's role it has in the environment in which it lives. So, transient mental illnesses similarly emerge due to the culture they come out of. They are very dependent on culture and this thus making them very complex and flexible as culture is multifaceted. Another important trait of a transient mental illness is that this dependence on the niche allows it to fade in and out of reality. So if the niche is destroyed as hacking writes, then the transient mental illness disappears. Hacking goes on to explain that this ecological niche is defined by four vectors. I'm going to read a quick quote as to why this word vector is used by hacking. He writes, quote, The vector metaphor has the virtue of suggesting different kinds of phenomenon acting in different ways, but whose result may be a possible niche in which a mental illness, a transient mental illness, may thrive. This means in order for a transient mental illness to arise, all vectors must be present within a single culture, thus creating a niche, thus the transient mental illness fills that niche. The four vectors hacking lays out for us are medical taxonomy, cultural polarity, observability, and release. So we're going to look into each of these a little bit. So medical taxonomy is this idea that the illness fits within the current systems of classification for mental illnesses. As Hacking writes, the illness should fit into a larger framework of diagnosis, a taxonomy of illness. This is true because transient mental illnesses have the ability to move in and out of reality when their niche is present. If a disease creates or an illness or disorder creates a new type of taxonic taxonic classification, it doesn't have the ability to just slip away. It's not for a moment falling into a category and then falling out when the niche is no longer present. If it creates a revolution in the naming system epistemological system for mental illness it is not going to as easily be able to slip away the second vector hacking presents is cultural polarity this means that the transient mental illness must be quote fitted between two social phenomenon hacking suggests that one phenomenon must be romantic and virtuous so positive in nature while the other must be vicious and tending to crime Hacking doesn't exactly present why this is necessary, um, but one hypothesis could be that if a mental illness is too vicious in nature, one would just be considered a criminal. 
on the other hand, if a illness was considered, you know, too good in nature, we wouldn't really consider it a disease because you're just being an amazing person. You're not mentally ill. So again, cultural polarity means that we are fitted between two social phenomena, one good, one bad. The next vector that hacking presents is pretty simple. It's simply just observability, observability, sorry, um, which basically just means for something to be a mental disorder, you must be able to notice it in some way. The patient, the doctor, biologically, behaviorally, whatever it is, it must be seen, not necessarily seen, it must be noticeable in some way. The final vector that hacking presents is this idea of release, that the mental illness must be a, quote, inviting escape from the culture which this person diagnosed with it exists in. He writes that mental illnesses will obviously provide some form of pain, pain to the sufferer, but also should provide some release that is not available elsewhere in the culture in which it thrives. To summarize Hacking's findings, we have that a transient mental illness appears at a time, in a place, later fades away. It is able to do this due to the niche that it fills, and this niche is created by four vectors, medical taxonomy, cultural polarity, observability, and release. For the next section of this podcast, we are going to be looking at dissociative fugue as an example of a transient mental illness that Ian Hacking presents in his book, Mad Travelers. To start, dissociative fugue is considered a mental, was considered a mental illness in which a person would leave their home feeling like they must go on this trip, walk very long distances in a single day. It would not necessarily be planned and throughout this journey they would lose their identity and when they got back they would have no memory of what happened throughout the trip unless they were hypnotized and the memories could be brought back to them. We're going to start first by defining the niche and giving a little bit of a cultural background as to what was happening when dissociative fugue popped up in society. Specifically, um, the fugue academic epidemic lasted for 22 years from 1887 to 1909. In this time in France, specifically where it came up, it reflected the age of tourism. Tourism was becoming available to the masses. Tourism was also being expressed in journalism and was everywhere in the media. At the same time, as the fugue fugue was becoming to its peak in France, This transient mental illness did not take in America. It did not become a diagnosable illness. This suggests the importance of Ian Hacking's niche in the creation of a transient mental illness. The conditions for the niche were only present in French culture, and therefore, fugue was only seen in French culture. To further delve into dissociative fugue, let's start by looking at transient, or sorry, let's start by looking at the one of Hacking's vectors, observability. So Hacking presents many different cases of fugue, and he looks at how it can look different in different patients. This is a sim. This is similar with every other mental illness that we have a diagnosis for. The exact experience of each patient will be different, but they're still similar in some way. He presents specifically, in most detail, the first patient's case of fugue, and this patient's name is Albert. Albert goes on multiple different fugues, and he feels as though he cannot prevent departing on a trip when he feels he needs to. He would walk up to 70 kilometers per day. He would not plan to go, but rather just be taken over so strong by feeling that he needed to leave, and he would. As I talked about before, he kind of lost his identity throughout the experience. He had no memory of what was happening during the trip until he kind of snapped out of it. And as Hacking wrote, quote, came to. Hacking writes that Albert went on these trips to work to eliminate himself. He wanted to lose his identity 
um, and he would not regain these memories until later when hypnotized. This fugue phenomenon was observed in multiple patients, such as Hacking, meeting, or such as Albert, meeting one of Hacking's four vectors. The next vector I want to discuss is medical taxonomy. Hacking writes, quote, Fugue could be accepted into the established taxonomy of mental illness without any need for revolution. This is just about all he writes about the medical taxonomy. He does delve a little bit into nomenclature and its significance, which I will discuss a little bit later in this podcast. But mainly the big idea that Hacking wants to get across is dissociative fugue was accepted into the medical taxonomy at the time could easily slip in when the niche was present and could also easily slip out when that niche vanished in 1909. The next vector to look at um, that hacking presents is cultural polarity. So again, this is the idea that a transient mental illness must fit between two areas in society. The good positive part and the darker or negative part. In this culture in particular, tourism was presented as a, quote, good positive activity that was, quote, romantic and intellectually rewarding. Tourism, as I said before, was really taking hold in France's society at this time, and thus was seen as a really positive thing. People were really enjoying being able to travel the world or even just travel to other countries. However, there was a, quote, darker side to travel that referred to vagrancy or the idea of being homeless, but to them at the time in France, it was more than just being homeless. Being on the streets was a sign of degeneracy and could land people in prison. It was written that vagrants must be eliminated systematically from society. They are ill, above all, is what Hacking wrote. This allowed dissociative fugue to sit in a very particular spot in this culture. It sat between the romantic, amazing parts of tourism and the idea of homelessness and degeneracy, thus meeting the cultural polarity vector. The final vector that Hacking describes is release. In terms of dissociative fugue, Hacking writes that travel um, was considered a form of rebellion. It was used as an escape and a way to relieve the working class of their responsibilities. Fugue was, quote, a medical entity of peace and thus allowed release for the patients experiencing it. From this quick analysis of Ian Hacking's book, we can see that Fugue was, quote, steeped in the social circumstances of France of that specific time in the 18 and 1900s. Dissociative Fugue arose as a transient mental illness because it's the niche was present with all four vectors that Hacking describes creating that niche. The niche later slipped away due to an end in vagrancy scares, and also many do it, many new diagnoses were being created that kind of just washed it out. It floated away from society no longer there, thus making it a transient mental illness. For the next section of this podcast, we are now going to take Ian Hacking's ideas and see how possibly they could fit into a current phenomenon being experienced in America and around the world, but a large focus is going to be on America here. So this phenomenon that I'm talking about is the connection between climate change and mental health. I'm going to start in this section of the podcast, simply talking about climatic distress and what it entails and who is observing it, where it's being observed, etc. To do this, I'm going to be looking at a report um, published by the American Psychological Association in partnership with Climate for Health and Eco America entitled Mental Health in Our Changing Climate. This was published in 2017. Again, I'll have it linked below if you would like to look at the whole report. I'm just going to offer a quick summary about what they discussed, um, particularly the most important parts that will be pertinent to a later discussion. So feel free to check it out if you'd like more information. I'm going to start really, really quickly with a brief overview on climate change. The goal of this podcast is not to debate climate change. Instead, the thought is, is that human activities are dramatically changing the world in which we live 
the increased use of fossil fuels and other practices participated by humans are increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gases then trap heat and the earth. This is known as the greenhouse gas effect. Again, not the point of this podcast, so feel free to look at that more on your own. In essence, um, the climate change that is occurring due to increased temperatures, there are going to be many, many effects on our overall climate. I'm just going to simply read a list that the APA presents in their report. They say that there could be more wildfires, more wildfires, drought, rising sea levels, more severe weather, more heat waves, rising ocean temperatures, higher prevalence of flooding, more pollution, more allergens, more diseases, and just overall a less prosperous world to live in. The effects of climate change are known largely on physical health and the physical environment. However, um, the APA writes that mental health might not be the first thing that comes to mind when one thinks of climate change. Thus, their goal with this report in 2017 was to expand information on the connections between climate change and mental health and also empower mental health care workers, individuals, and community leaders on you know, what to do with all this information. Quickly, I'm just going to read a list of different impacts of climate change on mental health. The report goes into great detail as to how these connections can be made. Um, Very, very, very interesting in my opinion. Um, Some of them are a little more obvious, others not as so much. So if you have any questions, check out the report. Super well done. As far as acute impacts on individuals, so this would be directly related to one of those more severe weather events, um, most likely, um, kind of more in the short term. So we have psychological trauma from the event, shock, PTSD, compounded stress, strains on social relationships. Um, These acute symptoms can also look like depression, anxiety, suicide or suicidal ideations, and substance abuse. In terms of long-term effects, this would be overall climate change, climate change in the long run, not just those floods or periods of drought, but rather in the long run, the chronic effects include ingre- increased aggression and violence from warmer temperatures, more mental health emergencies, loss of personally important places, loss of autonomy and control, loss of personal and occupational identity, and feelings of helplessness, fear, fatalism, solastalgia, and eco-anxiety. The impacts of climate change are extensive on mental health. Furthermore, apart from just the individual, we also have impacts on the mental health of community and society as a whole. These include a decreased sense of unity, a disrupted sense of belonging, increased interpersonal aggression, such as domestic abuse and crime, and increased intergroup aggression, such as political conflict and war. It is also important to recognize that climate change does not equally impact all groups of people. In particular, people living in risk-prone areas, indigenous communities, some communities of color, certain occupational groups with direct exposure, those with pre-existing disabilities or chronic illnesses, older adults, women, and children are all considered to be in a more vulnerable group. This is both for the physical health effects, but also, more importantly, um, in this case, the mental health effects. That's just a brief overview of climate change, climate change's impacts on mental health and mental well-being. All right, so with a brief overview now on climate change and its effects on mental health, we are going to be looking at whether or not there's a connection between this phenomenon and what Ian Hacking describes as a transient mental illness. This is going to help us look at the role of culture and society's norms in mental illness as a whole. To begin, we're going to look at the observability vector to see if this niche for a transient mental illness called potentially eco-anxiety, climate, climatic distress, soul nostalgia, etc., etc. More to come on that soon. As far as the observability vector, we have clear evidence that these mental health effects are present. They are observable. I would say that the observability vector is definitely met. For example, um, there was a report published or written by the American Public Health Association um, 
called Climate Change is Mental Health. And they reported that 25 to 50 percent of people exposed to an extreme weather event um, are at risk of adverse mental health effects. In addition, up to 54% of adults and 45% of children suffer depression after a natural disaster. Um, A specific example they provide is that suicide and suicidal ideation more than doubled after Hurricane Katrina. Another report um, written by the National Institute for Healthcare Management in the United States um, was written, or it was titled, Climate Change is Affecting Our Mental Health. And they reported that 51% of young people worldwide feel helpless when it comes to climate change and the resulting consequences. Clearly, from this data, we see that the mental health effects of climate change are observable. If the APA is going to take time to publish an 80-page report on climate change and its effects on mental health, it is clearly an issue we are seeing in society. It is observable. It meets Ian Hacking's observability vector. The next vector we're going to look at in term in terms of eco-anxiety, is medical taxonomy. If we're looking at eco-anxiety or climatic distress, and I've talked about these feelings of hopelessness, these feelings of anxiety, these feelings of not knowing, I guess, how to feel in response to climate change, just feeling greatly overwhelmed, it feels that, you know, maybe it could fit into anxiety. Maybe it could be a subcategory of anxiety. Maybe this would allow... um, to have that transient ability where it could come in and maybe if we solve climate change it can fade out when it's no longer needed or no longer present in uh, our culture um it could fit into potentially a form of depression um similarly as anxiety um another area i want to look at is looking at trauma um and kind of what trauma is and potentially the implications of creating eco-anxiety as a subset of trauma. In order to look at this, um, I read a book entitled The Empire of Trauma, which was written by Didier Fassen and Richard Rechtman. Apologies, both those people, I probably just butchered their names, but they wrote a book entitled The Empire of Trauma in 2009, and it mostly focused on Um, the history of trauma and how the view on trauma has largely shifted previously trauma was not really seen it was it wasn't acknowledged it was seen as the book writes um, trauma was a suspect condition now as the book writes the victim is recognized as such as a victim and therefore trauma is a legitimate status we now have an idea of trauma established that it is real that it is not the fault of the victim. So the important takeaway is that our idea on trauma has shifted. We now acknowledge the victim and trauma is legitimate. This book wants to look at what are, as they call it, the politics of drama. They ask this question to kind of delve into this idea. They say, what does this social recogni- recognition change for the men and women of today in the versions of the world and its history and in their relationships with others and with themselves? In other words, how does this newfound recognition of trauma change how other people view the traumatized, the victims, the survivors, um, and how does it also change how those survivors view themselves? This concept is very important if we were to potentially categorize eco-anxiety, climactic distress, as a form of environmental trauma. The book aims to analyze how identifying trauma can be used for and against those experiencing the traumatic event. So it looks at if we say this person experienced trauma, can that be used to get them resources? Yes, but could also be used to exile that person. Also, yes. So the goal of this book is to find that balance, is to find why this shift took place and now what does it mean what does it mean for the traumatized i guess i just leave you all with the question how would categorizing environmental trauma change the perception and reaction to those experiences maybe this isn't where it fits into medical taxonomy or maybe it is maybe our world has shifted in a way such that placing environmental trauma as a form of trauma would be meaningful with all that in mind with the idea of anxiety our current diagnoses of anxiety depression and relating to trauma i would tentatively say yes uh, the medical taxonomy vector is present 
for this form of climactic distress, but there are a lot of implications of placing climactic distress in any of these categories. We have shifting views on all of these forms of mental illness constantly, specifically as I talked about with trauma and the, the Empire of Trauma book, but that's kind of what is happening. So again, tentatively, Yes, there's a medical taxonomy vector. The last two vectors that Ian Hacking presents are cultural polarity and release. I didn't really find presence of these supported by any data or experiences. Personally, I'm not really sure of how experiencing climactic distress is culturally polar polarizing. Not the event itself, but how it fits in between two areas in society, somewhere how to dissociate a fugue in. I guess there's an idea of climate deniers, maybe, that could fit into this cultural polarity. Like I said, I didn't have any research to back that up so that's completely speculation the release vector again not really sure didn't find anything really about that in my research a potential idea i had was that maybe being diagnosed with eco-anxiety climatic distress whatever we want to call it could provide comfort for those that are too overwhelmed to act they feel oh now i have this diagnosis i can't think about climate change uh, it can be pretty overwhelming for a lot of people so maybe it's a, a a nice place to be where it's like i have this medical diagnosis i don't have to engage in conclusion of this little section i would say that is eco-anxiety a transient mental illness uh who knows um we're still living in the time where eco-anxiety or the feelings of climactic distress are present our culture is right now accepting of that idea um at least in some terms there's no diagnosis official diagnosis but it seems that from the reports right we know we know it's here we know it's observable as ian hacking would say but whether or not it has all those other vectors that create the niche to create a trend to get mental illness it seems uncertain and i guess that's where we'll end this section on a feeling of uncertainty We ended the last section with a feeling of uncertainty, or at least I did. We're going to look at now, if it is a transient mental illness, if it's not a transient mental illness, does eco-anxiety deserve a diagnosis? We're going to look back to Ian Hacking and his work on transient mental illness. He also just talks about mental illness in general. So we're going to look at specifically three different topics that he talks about. I call these topics the power of suggestion, what makes madness a real illness, and implications of a diagnosis. First, we're going to look at the power of suggestion. So there is a really cool quote, in my opinion, um, from Ian Hacking in his book, The Mad Traveler. So I'm just going to read this next little bit directly from him. He writes that, quote, I am especially impressed by the way that scientific knowledge about ourselves the mere belief system changes how we think of ourselves, the possibilities that are open to us, the kinds of people that we take ourselves and our fellows to be. Knowledge interacts with us and with a larger body of practice in ordinary life. This generates socially permissible combinations of symptoms and disease entities. So from that, we kind of get from hacking, I guess, that expert knowledge and experiences, knowledge of experiences maybe is the best way to say it, can in some way work to create a diagnosis. If we don't know how to conceptualize an experience, we're not gonna create a diagnosis. Maybe in some ways this could be similar to uh, Charcot and how he hypnotized uh, his patients and literally made them appear as though they were psychotic um, or mad or whatever we wanna call it. Um, just merely through suggestion. Um, I, I'm not trying to suggest that people are hypnotizing people to feel climate anxiety, but rather just the idea that our belief system and the culture in which we exist is allowing the idea of climate anxiety to come up. So m maybe it's just a, a large power of suggestion um, that's creating this. Hacking continues to write that the, the connection or the interaction between expert knowledge and the behavior of the troubled we don't have it clear yet. We don't know 100%. And that maybe the consequence of suggestion sometimes directly from a doctor or even just culturally absorbed can create um, a diagnosis. Maybe our society is like the media 
just a modern pop culture is pushing these ideas of climate change and all the negative impacts and we're not looking at any of the positives and blah 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 and that is pushing on people where unknowingly culture is molding people in to be climatically distressed that's something that ian hacking presents and with that in mind you know maybe you'd say well uh, i don't know is a diagnosis needed if our culture's almost forcing it upon us is that just maybe our new normal of culture is just push all of this bad information surrounding climate change onto people i don't know that's kind of something cool to think about though in my opinion and maybe it's just a new normal maybe it's society hurting society unknowingly away from that existential crisis uh the power of suggestion moving past that we are now going to look at what he and what ian hacking believes make something a real illness. He asked the question, quote, what counts as evidence that a psychiatric disorder is legitimate, natural, real, an entity in its own right? He answers this question later on by writing, quote, to call something an illness and not just madness is to imply that there are experts to be called in, professionals who can attempt or achieve cures. That is a profound statement that Ian Hacking makes. He claims that simply... To take something from just madness, something from just an experience of distress, to call it an illness is to say that there are cures or at least attempted cures to be made by professionals. With that in mind, um, I kind of want to take that idea back to eco-anxiety, back to the report written by the APA in 2017 and talk about what is happening to work towards a quote-unquote cure or attempting a cure, attempting to provide comfort to those experiencing these feelings, um, negative mental health effects of climate change. So let's just start there and then we'll return back to hacking and say, what does this mean (laughs) Um, in hacking's eyes? I'm just going to read a couple lists here uh, that just show that there has been a lot of research put into working toward a quote-unquote cure for climatic distress. So first, the APA prevents, presents ways to support individuals. So they say that building confidence in one's own resilience, fostering optimism, cultivating active coping and self-regulation, finding a source of personal meeting, meaning, um, boosting personal preparedness, supporting social networks, encouraging connections, upholding connection to place, and maintaining connections to one culture, to one's culture, can all be, in a way, a cure or steps, at least, to mitigate the feelings of climatic distress. In terms of those community mental health effects, like the disrupted sense of belonging and increase in aggression within communities, um, ways in which to support communities or professionals could support communities are by um, expanding mental health infrastructure, facilitating social cohesion, cohesion um, training climate first responders um, on mental health reducing disparities, developing trusted and action-focused warning systems, providing a faster response, or just a fast one in general, creating post-disaster plans, engaging community members, and providing opportunities for meaningful action and helping others. So again, that's a big list that the APA has provided to work towards the cure, I guess, that Ian Hacking would call it, work towards mitigating the feelings of climate distress. Furthermore, they go on to say, these are things that individuals can do, not support maybe professionals, can lend out or give out to individuals but rather what an individual can do on their own they write that creating house emerge household emergency plans can be helpful understanding medications and their side effects uh, especially when it comes to like water retention and temp- temperature regulations if medications affect those things those will be dramatically um, changed when climate changes Um, They also say that individuals can learn resilience interventions and build strong social networks, support clean energy and other climate positive initiatives to feel like they're making a positive change uh, towards climate change and as well as starting a community resilience project. So those are individual tasks, again, that can help mitigate it, um, potentially provide that cure that Ian Hacking was talking about. Lastly, there's a short list of things that mental health professionals can do. Uh, The the main audience of the APA, of course, would be... um, psychiatrists and psychologists and mental health professionals themselves so they are tasked by the APA I suppose by making the link between health and climate and the APA says that they can do this by um, becoming climate literate and staying up to date engaging with other uh, other professionals to inspire others to act 
being vocal leaders in support of climate solutions, and publicly sharing their expertise to influence the media, health leaders, and policymakers to help promote national and international solutions. That's a pretty long list, obviously, of things that the APA provides, and I guess I would call cures or steps to help eco-anxiety. Going back to that Ian Hacking quote, I just want to read it one more time. He says, to call something an illness and not just madness is to imply that there are experts to be called in, professionals who can attempt or achieve cures. From that list, I would argue that we have professionals to call in. We have psychiatrists, we have psychologists that can help teach people or build people's confidence and resilience or all those other skills I just talked about. From that, I would say, Ian Hacking would say, that climate anxiety should be an illness. It should be a diagnosis. Um, It should not just be considered a a form of quote-unquote madness, but rather it should be called an illness. If we've now created some hypothetical diagnosis and some hypothetical universe uh, (laughs) for eco-anxiety, Hacking goes on to describe the implications of a diagnosis. What does it mean when we call something an illness as opposed to just madness? When we have those steps towards cure by professionals, what does that mean? Ian Hacking writes that something being treated as an illness um, provides a route to get to medication, therapy, and bills. Bills, you know, insurance for the main most part. He really kind of only describes that as the point of creating a diagnosis, that it's for getting medication, getting therapy, billing, insurance. Simply put. In conclusion, whether or not climactic distress is being suggested or pushed onto people by healthcare professionals, society, and its culture are neither of those options. This phenomenon meets Hacking's definition of an illness due to the cures or mitigation steps provided by the APA. Thus, climactic distress in Hacking's logic seems to deserve its own diagnosis, and therefore the right to be medicated, supported by therapy, and billed for insurance. After spending a little bit of time looking at Ian Hacking's definition of a diagnosis and considering whether or not with those definitions, eco-anxiety deserves a diagnosis, um, I wanna present a new resource. Um, To further look at that question, does eco-anxiety deserve a diagnosis? Climatic distress, whatever we want to call it. To look at this question a little bit further, we're going to look at a report done by a group of researchers in New South Wales, and they looked at the mental health impacts of persistent drought and coal mining. And they culminated both those case studies into a report entitled Solastalgia, or solastasia, the distress caused by environmental change. They begin their paper by defining a psychoterratic illness. Psycho coming from psyche, the mind, and terratic coming from earth, earth-related. Therefore, they define a psychoterratic illness as, quote, an earth-related mental illness where people's mental well-being is threatened by the severing of healthy links between themselves and their home slash territory. They claim that nostalgia is an example of a psychotratic illness. Nostalgia used to be a diagnosable illness, and it was experienced by people who were distant from their home and wanted to return. Then the report goes on to ask, what about similar distress in people who are not displaced? So distress relating to home and territory in some way, but not about people that left their homes and they're distant from their homes, and that's why they feel this psycho erratic distress but rather they're still in their home but they experience a feeling of homesickness maybe similar to nostalgia they pose that question and say there's nothing there there's no answer so they state that therefore a new form of psychoterratic illness needs to be defined in order to build this definition as i said they look at a couple case studies of persistent drought and the distress that this causes for jobs and hobbies in particular, like farming and gardening, as well as the distress caused from coal mining surrounding air pollution, being unable to maintain health and habitat become, or I guess not so much habitat, but more land area that's maybe been in the family or something, like you're losing it. You're, you're losing value on your house if you're near it. 
et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of distress that they that they noticed in both of these areas where you're you're living in drought or you're living near a coal mine. And therefore they decided to create this new phenomenon called solastalgia. Th- this is a word that they defined throughout their study, um or worked to bring into the limelight, I guess you could say. This study was written in 2007. They state this new definition for solastalgia. So solace meaning comfort. Therefore, solastasia is, quote, the pain or distress caused by the loss of or inability to to derive solace connected to the negatively perceived state of one's home environment. So you cannot get comfort from the place that you live in because of its negatively perceived state. They also write that, in other words, solastasia is the distress that is produced by environmental change impacting on people while they are directly connected to their home environment. So different from nostalgia, where you're away, rather solastasia, you're in your home, but you're not getting comfort from that home environment due to environmental change specifically. They say that the the dominant components of solastasia are, quote, the loss of ecosystem health and corresponding sense of place, threats to personal health and well-being, and a sense of injustice and powerlessness. These researchers from New South Wales are really fighting for... Um, a new psychoterratic illness to be defined. However, they consider throughout the report how well the psychoterratic syndrome, such as potentially solastasia, captures, quote, the essence of the relationship between ecosystem health, human health, sense of human control, and negative psychological outcomes. So they're, they're fighting for a new syndrome to be new illness and new disorder to be defined they consider maybe solastasia um is the best but they they end with whether or not it really captures the essence of everything being experienced by humans this is a really common issue with nomenclature and epistemological systems is whether or not they really are able to fully capture uh, the experiences of an individuals within the culture that they live in the culture defines the people the the culture makes the people therefore the illness is a reflection of that culture and so capturing culture as well as the objective experience and kind of playing a balancing act between those two can be very very challenging and it's a constant issue um in a lot of fields but it's specifically in mental health to conclude this section the 2007 report performed by psychiatrists and environmental scientists in new south wales argues for a new diagnosis and the category of psychoterratic illness the current thought is to name this phenomenon solastalgia however uncertainty in the exact relationship between environmental health physical health mental health and culture still persists this uncertainty may be why a diagnosis still does not exist for feelings of climactic distress. Again, I feel we left that last section with a feeling of uncertainty, a feeling of, do we need a diagnosis? If we do, do we have something that resembles a diagnosis right now that just needs to be formalized? Is it needed in general? Uh, What would it look like? Um, how does culture interact with that and how do we objectify it away from culture but we can't because we all live within culture just a very complex system to look at the last question i want to look at and analyze in this podcast is does eco anxiety need a diagnosis for action to be taken clearly we have a lot of uncertainty around surrounding whether or not a diagnosis should be created what that would look like but let's take that part out just for a minute and ask if action can be taken without a diagnosis. To answer that question, I instead want to turn back to the uh, APA, American Psychological Association's report published in 2017 on mental health and our changing climate. They end this long report with a article or an excerpt from an article written by Lies Van Susteren. Apologies again for any mispronunciations. She is a doctor of medicine and also a psychiatrist. It's titled Our Moral Obligation, The Duty to Warn and Act. She begins just simply by explaining all the different experiences that people are having regarding climate change and that she sees and others in her field see that the psychological toll is quote becoming more apparent but much is being overlooked. So she she recognizes that climate change is impacting mental health. It's observable, maybe Ian Hacking would say, which we already talked about. But she goes on 
to write that, quote, we are trained. We are ethically bound to respond to emergencies. In this case, the we means mental health professionals. By this, she means that mental health professionals have an obligation to respond to emergencies. After writing that, she asks, quote, why then are some mental health professionals slow to respond to this issue? this issue being climate change. She's, she's seeing the psychological toll of climate change. She knows that mental health professionals are morally, ethically bound to respond to issues, but she's not seeing the response. In fact, she writes that, quote, more is needed. She sees some work of mental health professionals stepping up, but not enough. I want to wrap up the thoughts um, that I've shared today with a, a quote written by Dr. Susteren. She writes, quote, our canon of ethics says we have a duty to protect the public health and to participate in activities that contribute to it. This again, the we being mental health professionals. She continues writing, mental health professionals are required in all 50 states to report child abuse. It is a legal obligation, but it is also a moral one. Is it any less a moral obligation to report that we are about to hand over a destroyed planet for generations to come? This quote shows the shifting role that mental health and mental wellness is playing in society. It suggests that we are now a society that is aware of the mental health crisis surrounding climate change. We are frankly afraid, terrified of climate change, but we're not acting in a way to support our citizens and the continued health of our citizens. Here, mental health is being seen as it's being used as motivation to act. She's calling for action. Apologies for the noise in the background. If you could hear that, I'll say we're back. Dr. Susteren's call for action here uh, at the end of the report really shows that the APA is presenting this information to push for action. They, they hope to empower mental health professionals, show them that there is a way ahead in the face of climate change and how they can help their patients that are suffering. One more time, Dr. Sester, in a quick quote, she ends her article with a question. She says, what are we waiting for? I think the big, big takeaway from that is that do we need a diagnosis for action to be taken? It seems from that, no. It seems that we have the steps. We have that whole list of individual and community tasks that we need. And we just need to act on them. Despite whether or not we have a diagnosis for equal anxiety, for climatic distress, whatever, solastasia, psychotratic illness, whatever we want to call it, there are steps to act. However, we have to remember, as Ian Hacking said, that the importance of a diagnosis is that it provides us to get therapy, medication, and bill insurance. Throughout this podcast, we've taken quite a journey. I'm going to try to quickly brief over what we've talked about. First, we define a transient mental illness using Ian Hacking's writings. He writes that transient mental illnesses are mental illnesses that appear at a time and a place and later fade away. He defines that they pop up and fill an, ecolo an ecological niche that is created by four vectors, which are observability, medical taxonomy, cultural polarity, and release. We looked at dissociative fugue as an example of that and how it fits into all those four vectors. We next moved into defining climate distress and eco-anxiety from the National Institute for Mental Health Care. Quick summary of that, eco-anxiety is, quote, a form of psychological distress related to the climate crisis, an overwhelming sense of fear, sadness, and dread in the face of a warming planet. From there, we looked at whether or not eco-anxiety could be defined as a transient mental illness. We clearly saw that it was observable. We, we saw that it could possibly fit into medical taxonomy as a form of anxiety, depression, or trauma, and the implications of trauma. We looked at maybe it has a release providing comfort for those who are too overwhelmed to act, but not really sure how it fits in between a romantic and a virtuous part of culture being in cultural polarity. From there, we looked at, okay, maybe it's not a transient mental illness. Does it deserve a diagnosis in general? We looked at Ian Hacking, who wrote that the core requirement for an illness as opposed to madness is that professional health is present to create a cure. We looked at that APA report and saw that, yes, that is true. So maybe, maybe Ian Hacking would argue that eco-anxiety deserves a diagnosis. We also looked at the solastasia report, which argues for the creation of a new diagnosis called solastasia, a type of psychotratic illness. And what do we do with that? What do we do with all that? I'll leave you with this. Overall, mental health exists within a society full of culture. So mental illness categorizations inevitably reflect culture. Furthermore, this culture is historically contingent as the society we live in today is built on the generations and the societies of the past.
this dependence on culture and history isn't necessarily a bad thing in terms of mental illness. It's just something we have to consider. There's always implications of society and culture on the mental illness categorizations and experiences that we create or have. Although a diagnosis allows insurance, therapy, medications, and other formal processes to step in, action can still occur without one. Ultimately, this need for action, in my opinion, is the most important in the face of environmental and societal devastation driven by climate change. I hope you learned something today with me on Am I Thinking Right? Again, as I said in the beginning, none of this is definite truth. Rather, I hope this sparks discussion. I hope this sparks thought. And above all, thank you for being here.